Hello, very warm welcome to you as you join us for this conversation about Mako with Mako Fujimura uh, about his new book, Art and Faith, A Theology of Making, published by Yale University Press. Welcome, Mako, and uh, many thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. If you're watching this live uh, you, and you've got a question for Mako, you can uh, email it to the address you'll see on the screen, and we'll deal with it as we go along. Makoto is a leading contemporary artist whose paintings have been exhibited in galleries and museums across the USA and around the world. Born in Boston, Massachusetts, he has strong family and cultural links with Japan, and these connections deeply inform his work, as I'm sure we'll talk about. He's also a writer and a much sought after public speaker and Christian advocate for the arts, whose previous books include Culture Care, which is his response to the culture wars in North America, and Silence and Beauty, a reflection centered on Shisako Endo's novel, Silence, which was made into a critically acclaimed film by Martin Scorsese in 2016. And now in this new book, Art and Faith, Mako argues strongly on biblical and theological grounds that artistic making holds the key to understanding our humanity and indeed the very meaning of life itself. When we stop making, he writes, we become enslaved to market culture as mere consumers. Art is another way of knowing the world. Michael, were you encouraged to, to make things as a child? Did you come from a family of artists? Uh, my father was a research scientist, and uh, he actually considered what I, he did as uh, just as creative as uh, an artist. Um, my mother's side, I, I had two uncles who are artists. Uh, one was a playwright, and uh, the other is a relatively well-known painter. Um, and, and so I had these influences uh, with me. And um, I, I was very fortunate that I had an environment. Uh, my mother was an educator and, um, you know, I, I, I never felt um, I, I was not encouraged by them to uh, create. Um, my mother reminded me how hard it was for her uncles. And, um, and yet um, she kept a painting that I did when I was two and a half, um, which is... Um, um, this very much a child's, you know, abstract painting, but it uses the same colors and gestures I do today. <laughs> and oh, um, uh, she framed it and gave it to me for my graduation from college. And um, uh, that says a lot about my mother, who uh, always uh, probably saw something in me and and um, stewarded that uh, to the best of her abilities. And um, uh, I gave the painting back to her when she went into her nursing home and recently she passed away and I got the painting back. So mm -hmm. I reframed it. Uh, it's, it hangs in, in the um, foyer as I'm going out to my studio here in Princeton. Um, mm -hmm. I look at it every day and I, 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 it, I tell myself, oh, that, that's the freedom I, I need to have uh, in, in doing my paintings today. Yeah. So you were obviously encouraged in 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 that, and you 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 write in the book about experience a kind of electric charge when you yeah. were actually as a child um, yeah. painting the world around you. I mean, uh, you know, does does that still happen? Yeah, I mean, I I thought everybody had this experience until I went to middle school, and you know, found out that you don't talk about those things. Um, but I uh, do, and um, I consider my studio to be the most sacred space I know. And um, this is where I get to commune with the artist, uh, Creator God, um, who gave me this gift. I always knew this was a gift and not something that I owned or I um you know, I, I understood um, the uh, transcendence behind it. And, and so when I heard the voice of Christ, I, that was a resonating reality uh, that affirmed this experience. Um, it was, um, you know, to me, very obvious that th the voice of Christ was the creator's voice.
Mm. And this Japanese um, family background is clearly very, very important to you. But it's it's also important artistically, isn't it? I mean, you trained both in the States and mm. in Japan. Can you say more about that? Sure. So uh, since I was born in Boston, I... Um, my uh, national identity is in the U.S. Um, and, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen and, and so forth. But I, every time I painted in college, I felt drawn back to Japan, specifically 16th and 17th century Japan. Um, so I was fortunate to receive a national scholarship, a governmental scholarship that allowed me as an American to study in Japan um, that put me in a lineage uh, program. I'm, I'm still to this day the only outsider of the system, let alone outside the country, uh, to be selected for this um, prestigious, basically a mentoring uh, lineage program that harkens back to 16th century um, of Nihonga Japanese style painting. And um, I, I was I had access to the best resources of, in terms of historical documents or, or paintings that you know I could walk into a temple or museum and look at some of the works that I wanted to see, and and then um, and then training under a Nihonga master who um, notably uh, Mataso Kayama, who is a remarkable, one, arguably one of the best Japanese artists of 20th century. And um, so, so I had this privilege of navigating back and forth between US and of course uh, in US, I was very influenced by artists like Mark Rothko and Asho Goki and others. Um, early on. And um, so uh, growing, up, growing up in New Jersey allowed me to access New York City galleries and museums. Um, part of my thinking was art um, has captured some of the spiritual realities um, of 20th century well. Um, I, I think I was always spiritual and, and saw art as a means to um, understand that uh, at least and uh, eventually I ended up at the foot of the cross um, and and finding that voice to be uh, you know the, the the ontology of that to be uh, Christ uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth and and so my um, journey uh, even though it's bicultural and bi bilingual um, it, it is one of circumnavigating both sides, you know, American uh, culture, uh, which I value, um, and and obviously the Japanese, um, but even I have the objectivity, objectivity to see uh, something in 16th century Japan, which a lot of contemporary Japan, Japanese may not. Yeah, yeah, and then very interesting. So you there as an, a kind of a kind of an outsider, yes. Yeah. You know, um, in a sense. But before we we talk more about um, some of these uh, ways in which your kind of spiritual vision has as as kind of um, uh, and the, the theology of making, as you talk talk about. But can you tell us a bit more about this Nihonga tradition that sure. you're clearly, you know, you're you're really steeped in now? This this ancient tradition, um, which. Uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's 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 kind of quite foreign. You make your own paints, right? Um, right. Um, yeah. yeah, you 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 pulverize. Uh, this is azurite rock, but you pulverize minerals. Um, artisans in Japan, Nihonga shops um, will do that for you. In particular, grind and and you, you know, there uh, over the years you develop a certain affinity towards certain types of azurite. Which which uh, I use behind me. These are azurite and um, malachite uh, mixed with uh, Japanese hide glue called Nikawa, and painted in the same way that Japanese painters painted in 17th century. Mm -hmm. But obviously, what I do is contemporary, um, and these monumental works are really prayers uh, for for the energy, energy prayers for. Uh, 311 2011 disaster in Japan called so they're called walking on water 
the, over the over the years it's evolved a bit into something of a you know cries more universal cries of our heart um paintings and um, i used one of one of these walking on water pieces for the cover um of of, of art plus faith uh, which uh, was beautifully designed by yale press um so i i have these uh paintings which i hope to show in la um in next year um, um but you know I, i'm happy to have this as backdrop to my zoom yeah <laughs> can you tell us a bit more about the process because it's 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 not so much a kind of a, you know a um, a, a kind of um, uh, a style of 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 painting a portrait or a landscape or something. It's it's a method of putting paint down on the canvas, um, and it's it's a really painstaking method, right? Yeah, it's I call it a slow art because you're you're grinding up. You know pigments. I I don't do that myself, but I I mix the pigments myself, and I so you're basically making your paint, and it takes it takes time to master, and it takes time to make the pigments uh, right. And um, Japanese paintings traditionally has a motif uh, such as landscape and and portraits, um, but you know the way I'm using it is is more um, um, what you what typically would be called abstract. I I don't like that term because what I'm doing is uh, very much representing something, uh, reality with a capital R back into the world. And the slow process of Nihonga uh, is meditative and um, it is in itself allows me to um, capture <laughs> of creation um, in, in a new way, I think. I was privileged to see um, your show at the Waterfall Gallery yes. uh, New York a couple of years ago um, for a Regent event, actually. And you yeah. kindly, uh, you know, uh, spoke to us, but also uh, took us to the to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is brilliant. Um, but at the, the in this um, uh, the, the, your show in the Waterfall Gallery, there was one canvas monumental thing, triptych, uh, mm. a seascape called Sea Beyond. Yes. Um, and um, that was, uh, you know, just a, a, a vast thing, but but done in this technique. And I think you 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 told us that it was it, it was seashells that you you used. Yeah, to oyster shell, crushed oyster shell, white called goffin, which is a traditional white used in Japan. It's a magical, luminous white. Uh, but it's water-based. Um, they basically let the uh, oyster shells rot <laughs> in the beach for several years, and then they re refine it and create this pigment base. And when people stand in front of your canvases, I mean, it can be, uh, as with uh, with other kind of modern artists, it can be a kind of bewildering thing <laughs> to begin with because, you know, you wonder what you it, look, it looks like. Is this just... <laughs> A blue canvas or a, a kind yeah. of sandy gray canvas or what? What is it? And you you encouraged us to stand in front of it for a good 15, 20 minutes, yeah. uh, and we would you know we would get it. Um, yeah. What's that all about? How you know? I mean, it, it was a magical thing. I got to say, but can you describe to me what's going on there? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, David Brooks of New York Times came into one of my shows and I told him, you know, it's going to take you 10 minutes before you can start to see. And he was like, oh, what are you talking about? And to his credit, he sat down and he let uh, his eye rest. You know, what happens is we learn not to see because of uh, kind of the Darwinian reality of survival. You know, you identify things and you make decisions very quickly. And uh, our eyes are made, uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and our eyes are such amazing instruments that we, do, we learn not to use because we, um, we, we are constantly on the go. Um, but when you do see things, uh, uh, as in a sunset, um, you know, you are watching a sunset for some time. That's why it feels so beautiful or fireworks. Uh, the, these are experiences that we all have that, that um, you know, opens our, the eyes of our soul and, and allows the sensory perception to connect with the deepest realm of our integrated uh, being. And, and so when David spent 15 minutes looking at this monumental painting of Silence Mysterium, he said, I, I could not believe my eyes because 
I'm this, uh, all of a sudden uh, this entire galaxy opened up to me, and that is mm-hmm. typically the response uh, of people who uh, you know take their time. And and this this is the same thing, by the way, of looking at Mark Rothko painting um, or you know what watching a Terence Malick film. You know you the, you have to have this very much uh, mindset of um, what biblical uh, word would be you know kairos time uh, rather than you know naos time and and so so this is a um, uh, way in to see the transcendence and and after you do that by the way you go outside and the whole world looks different Mm -hmm. um, because you have just opened up a whole um, uh, realm um, in in your perception Mm. As you're describing this process and your process in, in the book, this Nihonga process, you, you're talking quite reverential terms about it. And um, you, you kind of, um, you talk about feeling that you're practicing a, a kind of liturgy. It's a devotion as, yes. as you're painting. Uh, and then you go on to speak more generally, as you have done already, actually, about uh, the way in which all art is, is kind of sacred. Um, can you can you talk a bit more about that? I mean, do you think that's true for other artists? Are you just talking about your own practice here, or are you are you saying some, making a claim here more generally about art? Right. I think anything enduring um, that human beings create, uh, whether it be art or uh, anything else, wine or you know, um, uh, but it tends to be enduring because there there is something. Um, very much uh, uh, captures the mystery of uh, being a mystery of creation. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to be a Christian to to tap into that, and and so it is universal in that sense that every every um, uh, you know theologically we, we understand that if if we believe in a God who is the creator and artist and maker, and if this God created us to be makers as well, uh, we are created to be creative then that, that is a universal principle. Um, and all of us can aspire to create something enduring. You say that when you enter your studio now, you, you feel like you're doing theological work as much as aesthetic yeah. work, artistic work. Yeah, it is, it is theological work. Uh, it, it is, um, uh, you know, th- um, theology lived out in, in paint and in movements and in, in the liturgy of what I do. Uh, what I do is uh, worship, um, done in love uh, for, for my God, uh, but, but also from my God. Um, and, and so it, it really is something that, um, I, again, all of us can tap into um, uh, at some level of any, any kind of practice that, uh, or mastery that, that takes years of, um, mastery to attain um, at that point there, there's a kind of freedom that you gain from it and you are locked in and tapped into uh, the Holy Spirit's um, um, you know intuitively and and that that allows us a, a kind of making that manifests God's glory into this world uh, without your ego getting in the, in, in the way and and that's you know that's um that's very important to have for us this experience Mm -hmm. alongside of your kind of celebration of um of 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 making and making in this in this slow way and 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 perceiving in this slow way as well actually taking time to you know alongside or maybe built into that is a critique of the way we live in, in the modern world, um, and you know, you, you you characterize us as as living in this kind of rationalistic, efficiency driven, um, utilitarian, technologically obsessed culture. Um, you you're pretty you're pretty strong on on this art and the make the the the, art, the, the whole theology of making as something that is kind of counter- countercultural in a way. Right. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with technology, you know, br- a brush is a technology, you know, you, uh, but we, we, we need to understand both its power and uh, danger of it. Uh, it, it you know, it, it can be, we- anything can be weaponized. 
And um, so that's why, uh, you know, cultural wars rhetoric is so dangerous because today the technology is so vast and powerful. Um, you know, so we, we can um, be makers um, uh, and, and use our hands to make it possible because that is the direct way that we get to know things. Um, and uh, we, uh, that's, the, that's, that's, you know, uh, still the best way to love is, 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 is through uh, senses. So, you know, what technology does is it highlights certainly um, it truncates um, the experience, but also highlights and amplifies a certain aspect of our experience that, that is um, driven by the marketplace. Um, and, you know, the, the utility of it and efficiency of it is, is, is wonderful. Uh, we're having this conversation on, on Zoom, but, um, but at the same time, there's limitations to this um, that, that we have to harness. And we, we have to have certain ways of understanding both ethically and theologically. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And, uh, and you, you, you kind of contrast a utilitarian approach with a gratuitousness right. um, that uh, is part of, of art, but also part very much of the Christian vision of life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure we, we, we use some of the words uh, carefully. I, you know, it's not the pragmatism that's, that's, uh, you know, um, a problem. It, uh, William James' definition of pragmatism is very much divine-driven, uh, you know, sense of purpose. Um, but utilitarian pragmatism, which is the industrial version of pragmatism, uh, creates a, a worldview in which human beings are part of the machinery to be bottom line, you know, um, uh, kind of being or doers that, that end up um, really uh, dehumanizing us. Um, so when I speak about the gratuity of God, um, you know, th there are really several things uh, that we do all the time, uh, or we should, um, that does not make sense in a Darwinian universe. Uh, they are beauty and mercy. Um, beauty doesn't make sense because if you are pragmatic and if you're just surviving, you just do survival, survival stuff, right? Um, you, you don't care about beauty necessarily. Um, beauty may be even dangerous to survival. Um, and mercy certainly is, is not, um, you know, something you want to do if you want to survive. Uh, you're care, taking care of the weak. Uh, you're, you're taking care of the sick. You're, you're creating uh, an upside down uh, world in, in which values are not, uh, not of this world. And so there, therefore, they, beauty and mercy uh, are connected with God's love. In that God, uh, you know, in God's aseity, God's uh, creation, uh, God's being, uh, all sufficient reality of God, um, states that in Genesis, God did not create need to create. Uh, you know, even though the Bible starts with God's creation, uh, God did not have a did not do that out of need. Um, God does not need us. God does need, need the universe. God does not need us to prove that God exists. <laughs> God is God. Um, and God is not just the source of beauty, but God is beauty. So, so we, uh, you know, the, the, the why God, did God create? God created because God is love. And love is gratuitous. You know, when you're going out on a date, you don't do utilitarian things. <laughs> you know, you, you may need to do utilitarian things, but you want to get to uh, the gratuitous, the extravagant, the beautiful, um, you know, or even merciful, uh, right? So, so those, those are things that attracts us in love, um, which God has already, um, you know, exuded into creation and into us, especially that, that we are uh, beings created for love, by love, and through love. So, so we, we are able to 
create ourselves something that is love based rather rather than utility based or you know something that is uh, ego driven and it's surely out of our need and mm-hmm. and those things tend to not last they 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 may be flashy and you know loud but they are not something that will endure the test of time the mm-hmm. things that even in our lives uh, things that we value the conversations that we will remember on our deathbeds are not the things that we you know typically society says you need to do to resume build to to have all these materials to things that uh, no, these these are intangible experiences that we had with our loved ones, intangible experiences that we had um, experiencing God's presence in our lives. Those are the things that we remember. And those tend to be the things that art, uh, enduring art can capture. And so that's why I say, you know, art is useless <laughs> for survival, but that's why it's essential to humanity. <laughs> It's really interesting your your comments on contemporary Christianity because you, you you kind of suggest at various points that 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 actually much Christianity of our times is part of the problem rather than part of the cure. Um, yeah. Here's is something you wrote. Uh, let me let me push you on this one. Could it be that we have missed the essence of the gospel message by focusing merely on an industrial, commoditized way to convey the information of the gospel? or even to sell the good news in the most efficient manner prescribed by our entrepreneurial or industrial mindset. And, you know, you kind of suggest elsewhere that it's easier in some ways to kind of get your non-Christian friends to understand your motivation and your feelings as an artist than it is to to kind of get Christians to, that's, that's pretty, that's a pretty bad indictment, isn't it, of, uh, of where we're at? Well, you know, I I um, I love the church. Uh, I, I um, and it, uh, what I write is 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 to uh, my dear family, you know, and 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 yet I I look at how Christianity is, uh, you know, as an artist, I'm interested in form and content. You know, there's the content of the gospel, and what is the form. And the fruit of that is the ultimate test. It doesn't matter what we say about ourselves. You know, how is the fruit of our faith being manifested into the world? And how, how are we to uh, carry out this uh, Great Commission in, 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 in ways that can communicate, uh, you know, with baptized reality, um, the fullness of God's love into the world? Right. So when I ask myself, and and I, I do this often um, in in the context of within the church and outside the church, um, but typically in in both places, both cases, um, if you ask, uh, if we ask ourselves, and if we ask a stranger who is outside the church, how do you see the church? What are some of the words that come up in your mind when you think about the Christian church? Um, it's pretty indicting. Um, you know, we we talk about in our um, you know discipleship programs, uh, Galatians five, fruit of the spirit, uh, being filled with the spirit will give birth to the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, um, uh, uh, faithfulness, and goodness, and so forth. Right, the self control. And yeah, if we ask outsiders about how they see the church. Uh, they see uh, hatred instead of love, right? Anxiety instead of peace, right? Um, and and this this uh, culture wars, right? Um, in, in, in instead of faithfulness. So so what has <laughs> translated? You know what is what is the form and and content here? Right. And, and, and uh, you might say, well, that's outside the church. You know, they don't, uh, you know, they're fallen creatures, you know, and, and so, okay, let's talk about us. Let's talk about the church. How are Mm -hmm. we doing? Yeah. You know, I mean, are are we exuding love? Are we, you know, how is our art doing? Mm -hmm. Is it full of love? Is it full of joy? Is it full of peace? 
or is it something else? And and I'm not saying that to make anybody feel guilty about it. It's just the reality we're facing. That means we have not understood and and manifested God's love in in our lives. And I include that in my you know that criticism is <laughs> about me as much as anybody else in the church. But but the broken body of Christ. Uh, we 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 have to begin by addressing the the brokenness first, and mm-hmm. uh, you know when you look at the form, uh, you see spectacles, the mega churches. You see, uh, you know, even churches in strip malls, and you know how is that communicating the love of God and beauty of God? We 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 you know we can say well it's pragmatic. We you know you don't want to spend millions of dollars invested in, you know, uh, church building uh, because you can feed the poor. Or are we feeding the poor? <laughs> you know, what, what, is, what is it that we are after? It, you know, you can go beauty or mercy or both. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, we have to e- express something that is extravagant, that is, that is beyond the reality of this world. And you do it wisely with wise stewardship and fiduciary ways, but but still, you know, at the end of the day, what are we communicating to the world? And is uh, is what we do beautiful? And and you know, is our fruit good? Yeah, and you know, you are, however, sort of calling for a kind of paradigm shift in the way we think about life. Actually, um, you know, this this idea of 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 a theology of making, you know, making as a way of knowing, you know, yes. making as a, as a way of, of, of understanding the world. I mean, uh, for a lot of people, that's a kind of, that's a big jump. You know, we think about propositional truth yes. and um, kind of, you know, um, truth in philosophical terms and arguing about truth. Um, but you seem to be kind of saying, well, you know, there's another way of knowing the world. There's another way of, of engaging with the world that yeah. actually maybe is way more, important for our time and it's not about standing up and arguing with atheism or whatever it's about making stuff it's about yeah. creating things yeah and at region uh, is a great place uh at least in my experience to have this discussion uh, this idea of somatic knowledge this idea you know senses being part of uh, 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 uh epistemology is is very much, you know, something that I think um, your um, effort at Vision has has empowered and and encouraged, um, and and so this this would not be alien to many of your students, but but it is it, it, strictly speaking something that um, over paradigm shift still because um, you know I I, I have this chapter on knowing and and uh epistemology and you know and how uh, you know uh, if you're making an omelet right um the question is not whether the recipe is good or not it's whether the omelet (laughs) is good or not and you have to taste the omelet to know if the recipe works or not right so we do the reverse we argue about the recipe first and we have all these <laughs> ways of teaching the right recipe, but rarely do we see a class in which we test the fruit first and we taste the fruit first to see if it's good or not. Mm. It's a manifestation of our theology in, in community. Is it good? And if it is good, we can kind of backtrack <laughs> to the recipe and uh, learn how this community was formed. But typically it is, it is about head knowledge. It is about, you know, um, you know we sit in classrooms and, and force our you know, effective side of the brain to catch up with the left side of the brain, the rational side. <laughs> and, and then, and then they, you know, hopefully that would translate into our actions. Right, and and so it's it's backwards from what uh, you know neuropsychologists tell us how we learn. Uh, we learn things bottom up, right, left. So mm-hmm. you know we are born into the world and we experience the world through us, or touch, smell, taste, 
right? First, and that gets translated into emotions first. Um, and, and through our emotions form the language, the generative language that, that is, you know, that harnesses those experiences into words and identifying, you know, mothers and parents that, that are important to us. But, but we, we're doing things backwards because we're force feeding the left side of the brain, the analytical side, the rational side, and creating all these little categories so we can you know, identify ourselves in those categories and defending our turf. And then, you know, then we're trying to make that into uh, effective side and then the communal side. And, and it's, 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 it's very difficult to do that. You know, if you're trying to, uh, it just, just physically, it's very difficult. And, and so I do think that we would do far better. First of all, act of making uh, is what we are built to do. Uh, even as a child, um, we, we are always making something and our hands come you know, a sensory touch allows us to know the world through play, through making. And, and so, you know, we, um, we have forgotten in a way we have educated ourselves out of that, you know, childish activity. But, but really, when, when I find uh, the most vibrant communities, all those elements are there. There's community, there's food, there's, there's dance, there's theater, there's art, there's, you know, music, there's all these sensory uh, perceptions are uh, activated and, and tied into the communal knowledge about the values uh, to which they, you know, they, they hold dear. So, so it, it, it makes sense to me to reverse the process and, you know, even, even understand that education uh, it starts with a somatic making. And then the questions that are formed after you do that and the conversations that you have can, can be invaluable in terms of then understanding uh, uh, affective side and then the rational, the propositional side. Um, you know, so, th so those, those, uh, those can still happen. Uh, it's just that, you know, we, we probably need a new uh, paradigm to, to uh, understand epistemology. Yeah. Now, I know that when you're, when you're talking about beauty, you're very, very aware of the, the brokenness of our world and that yeah. the, the beauty that you create as an artist comes out of that brokenness and relates to it in, in profound ways. Um, you, you, your story has got uh, uh, kind of intersections with, with some really interesting but devastating kind of occurrences that have been in many of our minds, in, including 9-11. We've got a question about that, actually. Let me, let me just pull that up um, from a, a, um, uh, yes, if I can find it here. Uh, my question from you said in your account of 9-11 for Image Journal, Create, we must, and respond to this dark hour. The world needs artists who dedicate themselves to communicate the image of shalom. Jesus is a shalom. Shalom is not just the absence of war, but wholeness, healing, and joy of the fullness of humanity. We need to collaborate within our communities to respond individually to give the world our shalom vision. Is this still your vision uh, uh, for the faith community? Well, absolutely. All of my books are about that. That was an email that I wrote uh, three days after 9-11 um, and um, responding to concerned emails from my friends because I lived three blocks away um, with, with my children. And so that, um, yeah, that I wrote that, <laughs> I think like 3 p.m., 3, 3 a.m., you know, in the middle of the night. And uh, I, I I do think in out of duress and out of trauma, um, you know, it, it kind of squeezes you, and um, you write things or you paint things that, um, in some ways, intuitively you you don't really know what you're saying, <laughs> but but it becomes prophetic for your own life. I've got a, a question here from a neighbor of yours in. Uh... In Princeton, by the looks of things, Benjamin Roberts, you said your process of making art was meditative. Yes. What does this mean for you, particularly in relation to God? 
Well, it's directly connected to how I worship. Um, I'm a high introvert, so quarantine time has been <laughs> rather, you know, good for me um, to draw back into myself. I, I didn't have to travel anymore. I, I was in my studio every day. And um, and when I'm here in my, in my quiet um, and working uh, with my materials, I just sense the presence of God. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, I realize once again, that that's, that's what I'm made to do. Um, so, you know, I think med medita meditative practice, you know, I started a uh, project about two years ago on the Psalms um, of working, actually the, there's one down there, I'm working on Psalm 90 right now, but every month I go through one Psalm, um, one painting uh, of that Psalm, 48, Sent, it's 48 inches by 48 inches so it's rather large and um it it's just large enough that you can't put it in a car <laughs> so so it's it's you know it, it it has to be um intentional you know if you're going to carry it um um and um it it's something that um i realized also that if you do one psalm per month it's going to take you 14 15 years <laughs> to complete so when i started i wasn't thinking about that but but i you know now now i'm kind of locked in so i come to the, the studio every morning and i start uh intentionally using slow materials um uh, such as sumi and calligraphy ink or uh, oyster shell gofen um and, and very basic minimal materials and these are not meant to be uh illuminations or illustrations they are meant to be meditations on the mm -hmm. psalm yeah. so um to me that is the way i want to start the day um and uh my friend uh dear colleague uh, dr ellen davis at duke uh, uh, Hebraic scholar, and um, she found out that I was doing this, and she said, "Well, what translation are you using?" And I listed all the translations, uh, Robert Alter, and so forth. And she said, "Well, I, I think I would like to translate a psalm per month for you." <laughs> mm -hmm. So she's been translating uh, mm -hmm. these psalms, and one of my fellows, who is a visual artist but also a spoken word artist has been recording the Psalms that she translates um, all in, in, into um, iPhone. And, and I, so I listened to uh, Julia Hendrickson reading the Psalms and then I, I work on the painting slowly every day um, as a meditative practice. Your, your book has a strong biblical focus and particularly on the story of Mary and Martha yeah. and the raising of, uh, of their brother Lazarus. By Jesus, and you you home in particularly on this word, this verse, the shortest verse in the Bible, uh, pretty much. Uh, Jesus wept from um, from John, John eleven, I think. And uh, this you, you call this like um, a pinhole camera into the whole of the biblical drama and into the whole, the whole of your understanding of art as well. So, can you say more about that? Yeah. So the entire book uh, is actually built around John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Um, it, it is a pinhole for my uh, my life, uh, my my art, uh, my writings, um, and actually the book itself is is a life work. Um, I've been writing this book for 30 years um, because it's my response to reading the Bible uh, as an artist, assuming that God is the artist, perhaps the only artist, the true artist. And so, um, you know, it's a grand theme. It's ambitious uh, and in scale and it's parag paradigm shift. Um, so, um, you know, I always say to young artists, the younger artists that, you know, the, the more ambitious the project, the, uh, the tight the lens has to be, you know, the, the, the focus has to be really tight uh, in, if you're doing something uh, big. And so um, I, I have chosen the shortest passage in the entire Bible, two words, Jesus wept, um, 
to really understand the gratuity of God. You know, first of all, Jesus uh, standing in Bethany with Mary um, did not need to uh, waste his time weeping. He, he was there to resurrect Lazarus. All he had to do was take Mary, uh, who Mary who was angry at him for not coming to rescue her brother from death um, and was grieving. Um, uh, all he had to do was take by the hand and bring her to the grave and resurrect Lazarus and tell her, ye of little faith, you, know, you should trust me. Um, I have come late intentionally to show forth the power of God, which is what he tells his disciples already in the chapter. But he doesn't do that. Um, he stands uh, with Mary in anger uh, to weep. Uh, so why? <laughs> and that question reveals the extravagance of Genesis. Uh, that question reveals that God, even though God does not need to create at all, God doesn't need a creation, God doesn't need us, but created out of gratuity and love. That is translated in the New Testament, in my mind, through those two words, Jesus wept. And that is the entirety of Jesus' mission. And, and that is the way that we can enter into through this pinhole in into the upside down kingdom of of god mm -hmm. and, and when we do that we discover just like mary did that jesus tears are costly not just extravagant but costly he is going to have to pay for his tears and just as in, um, you know, in our archaeologists have found these tear jars in Israel. Uh, tears were very valuable uh, back then. Um, and, and so they collected tears. I, I believe that the tear jars of God's grace um, that has literally, uh, because of Jesus's divinity, um, has um, Jesus's tears evaporated, went into the air and multiplied, um, uh, just like the fishes and, and, and the loaves, you know, it's, it multiplied into the world. And therefore, uh, it's raining here today in Princeton, but Jesus's tears are still with us. And I, I pretend at least that I am painting with Jesus's tears um, because of the water-based materials I use. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the level of beauty and mercy that does not make sense in a Darwinian universe is still the overwhelming reality that surrounds us, even through the pandemic, even through the darkest times that we can ever experience, that this, this presence of God is still with us. There's a, there's a nice question here from Malcolm Geit, who, uh, who oh. says, lovely to hear that you're making art in response to the Psalms, yes. a place in the Bible where suffering gives rise to beauty. Yes. Do you find the suffering of the psalmists helps you to reframe your own experience of suffering or understanding it in a new way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, not, not only to understand, but but to be shocked by the authenticity and honesty of the psalmist, you know, and the shock that God would take these words of anger and, and um, you know, um, a, a honest portrayal of, of our state of being uh, in, in depravity and in fear and anxiety and hopelessness. Uh, God would take those words and make it as part of God's sacred text. Mm. That, that is shocking, you know, to, to like, if I were writing a Bible, <laughs> I would not do that. You know, it's like turning, a, you know, some uh, hip hop song written by an atheist and creating a sacred text out of it. But that's precisely what psalmists do. Um, so, you know, m many of them are in doubt that, uh, you know, where are you, God? Uh, why, why have you forsaken me? Um, but 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 those those are the entry point the, the, the of suffering that that uh, somehow turns us into s s sacred creatures and our uh, imagination can be 
um, turned into this um, incredible uh, place of safety when we can be honest before God. Um, and, and somehow being a child of God, uh, that seems to be the requirement, is that we, we are able to cry out to our Father in heaven um, in our darkest moments and, and ask, ask without really, without, uh, as T.S. Eliot notes, without faith, um, you know, find that hope. Um, and and that, that's, that's what I find in the Psalms. One of your great influences, Mark Rothko, you, you've already talked a bit, a bit about him, but I mean, he said that unless people, uh, you know, um, people who went to see his art wept in front of them, they weren't having the same experience as he had when he was, when he was painting it. And you seem to suggest that a lot of modern art, actually, mm. contrary to kind of Christian dismissal of it, is actually a kind of prophetic... Um, uh, uh, entering into this weeping about the state of reality. Yeah, and uh, it's it's to the contrary. I think many of these expressions um, of 20th century, um, you know, that were done uh, without the connection to the church, are the most spiritual sp statements um, about our age. Um, the church did not create many masterpieces. We must remember that. Um, there are in museum, uh, Museum of Modern Art founder, Alfred Barr, was a son of a Presbyterian minister um, out of Princeton, actually generations of um, ministers, um, who said specifically that what he is doing, uh, his zeal and passion for uh, modern art is uh, it's carrying out the mission of what the spirit is doing in the world. Uh, he, he was, you know, um, um, uh, uh, struggling with his faith as well. Um, and he was, you know, uh, unable to express his religion uh, in, in the way that his father did at Princeton and Princeton Seminary. But, but he was nevertheless carrying out his mission to bring this form of art, uh, including Rothko, including De Kooning, including Malevich, whose paintings are literally icon paintings. They are just done in a persecuted time. So he couldn't paint icon, you know, he couldn't write icon uh, paintings anymore, but, but he painted these abstract minimalistic paintings. If you trace the entire 20th century um, of art, film, modern dance, it, it's, it's filled with the spiritual connection. Um, but, but we have them fighting culture wars, so we, we can't enjoy them or see them. Um, we, we have uh, neglected our stewardship of ourselves making, so we don't participate in what the spirit is doing in the world. We, we have uh, um, kind of surrendered um, our authority to both create and to critique art uh, by entering into the front lines of culture um, in New York City, Los Angeles, in Vancouver, wherever you are. And, and so we're, we're not able to, um, you know, speak objectively at all or, or in ways that are persuasive to the world. Um, and the church needs to get back to, to our primary task of making. We, we, we were the makers of, uh, you know, public education. We were the makers of hospitals. We were the makers of art and music and dance and theater and, and these, these um, and beer, you know. <laughs> so, so we need to get back to that place of making we are created to be creative god is the artist creator um, and we bear his image and 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 the way that we carry that out is is in um making and and through that god will usher in somehow mysteriously the new creation make it new was one of those sl great slogans of modernism wasn't it and in a way it's a kind of it's a kind of theme of your book newness is very much a yes. part of what you're talking about um, yeah. in, uh, in in this book, and you connect it with the resurrection of life. You talk about having a, a Lazarus culture. What do you mean by that? 
Yeah, so I talk about new newness. Uh, the word uh, Greek word kainos um, is, you know, it's translated. We're in Christ. We're new creation. Uh, but we tend to think of new in the industrial sense. So new is something like an iPhone, you know, uh, new every year, you know. But but it, that's not what kainos means. That's neos. Neos is something that's flashy and new and you know temporary. But kainos, uh, I th I think is a really powerful word, uh, which uh, the way I transliterate that is new newness. It's a new concept of what is new. So it's a paradigmatic newness, which is the resurrection. And in Christ, we are that new newness. That means that we have the DNA uh, of, of what is required to create something entirely new into the world as well. Uh, this is not a limited resource environment in which you're competing for resources. This is a, um, a promise of new creation that is given to every Christian to harness. And, and everything we do in faith, everything that, that is done through creating beauty, providing mercy, uh, and evangelism, those, those things are all part of our mission in newness into the world. So, so again, this has to be embodied, it has to be communal, it has to be in, in a way that, you know, allows us to um, see the fruit, taste, see and taste, taste the fruit. Um, so Lazarus culture is very simple. Uh, Lazarus says one line, you know, he doesn't even speak, right? He, he is reclining at the, the, the table with Jesus after he is resurrected, while the, um, the, the entire world wants him in some way, and, and, and the authorities are after him because he's causing trouble, and he's causing many people to believe in Jesus because of his uh, temporary resurrection. Um, so, so FBI warrant is out, out on him, death threat by the mob is out on him, and yet all he's doing in that one line is reclining at the table of Jesus. The, yeah. the, the, I can just imagine what he's saying to his you know, friends who are worried about him. He said, guys, I was dead. <laughs> I was rotting in the grave, and I heard a voice of God, and here I am. You know, mm -hmm. I, there's nothing that I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, nothing phases me now. As long as I'm with Jesus, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. Um, now, with, uh, now, now with, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, thing is, the thing is, we know today in post-resurrection journey, more than Lazarus knew then in his temporary resurrection. We know today that there is a permanent resurrection coming, that Jesus himself went through the portal to show us the way. So we have no excuse. We should be just as relaxed, just as confident as Lazarus is at reclining at the table. As long as we're with Jesus, we're going to be okay. Um, we, we're coming to the end of our conversation, Marco. We've got a couple of minutes left, but I can't can't uh, end this without talking about one of the most beautiful images in your book, which is uh, where you bring, bring this theme of brokenness and beauty together around the um, the kintsugi, uh, yeah. tradition, kintsugi tradition of art in, in Japan. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I have a teacup here um, that we used in our first uh, Kintsugi Academy workshop in New York City. And my friend Esther Moon, uh, who is a designer, uh, there was a crack and she mended it with Japan lacquer and poured gold onto top of that. Kin is gold and Tsugi means to mend. Uh, but she also did something else here. She added this squiggle, <laughs> delightful design, thereby making this more valuable than the original. And this is a new creation. But it, rather than hiding the flaws and fractures, Kintsugi masters will mend in a way that highlights the fractures and, and allows the newness to come through a broken vessel 
And because it's using Japan lacquer, a, a natural uh, resin, you can reuse this uh, in a tea, tea ceremony. Now that's a profound theological reality. Jesus's post-resurrection appearance shows that his nail marks are with him. In fact, Thomas asks to touch them. <laughs> and Jesus, of course, shows up and says, go ahead and touch these. And Thomas doesn't. He kneels down and worships, the first male disciple recorded to do so. So we, I think this is a profound reality of understanding the new creation, that it is through his wounds we are healed. But Jesus remains with those wounds, just like a kintsugi remains in its um, fracture. But gold is poured through them. So it is through his wounds that the new creation will appear. And extension of that is that what we go through in life, our fractures, our broken vessels, are also part of God's great mysterious design to make us new. So rather than trying to fix ourselves, to make us perfect so nothing ever happened, Perhaps the church ought to be a place where we can bring our broken pieces and we can ask the Kintsugi master, Jesus himself, to not just fix us, but the man to make us new through our fractures. That's a great note on which to end. Thank you so much for, for being Absolutely. with us today, Marco, and thank you for your wonderful book. Um, I just want to mention the fact that one of Mako's magnificent paintings will feature in a new show at the Shindal Gallery at Regent College. The um, show opens on May the 5th. The show, which is a collaboration with Sanctuary Mental Health Ministry, is called Healing in Colour, and it explores the intersection of race, faith and mental health, featuring Black, Indigenous and artists from around the world. Uh, the show highlights their experiences wounds and journeys of healing and um, uh, I haven't seen this painting but uh, it's yeah, something I, I want to thank my friend uh, Lawrence O who collected my work uh, very early on and he's um, you know allowing his painting to be shown so thank you to Lawrence and Angela. So if you're lucky uh, enough to be in Vancouver and the lower mainland uh, uh, of British Columbia be sure to get yourselves along to the Shindell Gallery to see uh, uh, healing in color and Mako's painting. Thank you so much. Thank Mark. you. Thank you for joining bye us. Bye. Uh, see you again next time. Okay. Bye bye.